Here we're driving from the Eagle's Nest to Braunau am Inn, crossing the border with Germany and Austria. Along the way we're sort of straddling the border and you can't see it, but there's a river right behind the buildings to our left, just a few hundred meters. I felt like I wanted to tell an unusual story about the Nazi takeover of Austria. Yes, Austria collaborated with Nazi war criminals after the war and even elected an SS member as their president, but that's led to historians sort of changing Austria's stance from the first victims of the Anschluss to its collaborators. After the Great War, the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed, and the idea of unifying Germany with Austria was getting really popular. After the war, the idea got over 60% of the vote, but after Hitler's rise to power, most moderate parties opposed Hitler. Shortly after he came to power, there were two other major fascist governments in Europe, Austria under Engelbert and Italy under Mussolini. They both initially opposed Hitler and wanted to maintain their own corporatocracies, so Mussolini promised to help defend Austria. In July 1934, Hitler began the July Push, or the Vienna Push. It was designed to oust the Austrian fascist regime and establish a pro-Nazi one. On the 25th of July, 154 SS men disguised themselves as Austrian soldiers and raided the Austrian Chancellery. Immediately, the Chancellor was killed by an SS soldier, but the rest of the government managed to escape. It seems like they kind of knew that they weren't going to be able to conquer the country, but they figured they could at least kill the leader and give the chance for a pro-Nazi party member to come into power. Another group of SS took over a radio station and said that they'd killed the chancellor and signaled SS cells across the country to start fighting. By April 10, 1938, a Nazi regime was in place in Vienna. They cast a vote for unifications, and polling stations were all staffed by SS troops. The option for unification wasn't much of an option. Official sources say that the vote was 99% in favor with a 99% turnout. It's obviously a lie, and the ballots themselves had a circle that was huge supporting unification and a very tiny one saying that they wanted to remain independent. So it's hard to tell if Austria really wanted to join the Nazis. On the one hand, they eventually unified and were fascist from the start, but on the other hand, they didn't support Hitler's brand of fascism, and they even allied with Italy during the push to prevent the Nazi takeover. This is a look across the border from Germany. This is the border with Germany, just over a river that I was talking about earlier. It's only a five-minute walk from the house where Hitler himself was born. And here's the Braunau city gate. The gate here is between the bridge to Austria and Germany and the apartments where Hitler was born. Hitler was born in 1889 at this Austrian inn. In front of it is a memorial stone from Mauthausen concentration camp. Although he only lived here for 14 days, it's become a sort of pilgrimage site for neo-Nazis. The owner refuses to negotiate to remove the building, but the Austrian interior minister wants nothing more than to bulldoze it. In 2016, the Austrian government took it back and paid 800,000 euros in taxpayer money as sort of a settlement. It's unclear what they want to do, tear it down, or build a sort of museum out of responsibility. As of November 2019, they said they want to turn it into a police station, but their stance on the matter has changed almost a dozen times over the years. This is the cemetery in Leonding, Austria. Hitler's parents moved here when he was a baby, and he spent seven years growing up in the house across the street from the church. His parents were peasants, and Hitler's father joined the customs service. They were both buried in this churchyard, but their grave was removed just a few years back after becoming a Nazi pilgrimage site. Also buried here are a number of Nazi soldiers in the war. I found information on one of them. Franz Rittenschorber was a pilot in the most successful night fighter squadron of the Luftwaffe before he became an NCO in the 1st Mountain Division, known for committing multiple war crimes. Across this bridge was the Burger Brau Keller Beer Hall. In 1923, Hitler led a push to raid it. Their targets were three men active in politics and military of Bavaria who were giving his speech here. He threatened to kill them and then himself if they didn't support him. And they did, but eventually they escaped and redacted their support when he wasn't looking. So Hitler, in rage, decided to march into downtown Munich. They ran across the main bridge and about 2,000 Nazis convened near the center of Munich, attempting to overthrow the government by raiding the main city hall of the Weimar Republic there. The route would become a famous Nazi pilgrimage march every year. They passed through one police barricade pretty much unscathed, but there was a half-minute long gunfight just outside the city hall gardens which killed 16 men. These later became martyrs for the cause, or so-called martyrs. In my eyes, they're not really heroes, but they were interred in this building which Hitler later described as the spiritual heart of world fascism. He was thrown in Landsberg prison, but the judge was a Nazi sympathizer, so he was given the most lenient sentence of five years. 
He only served nine months of it, and it was in this prison that he wrote Mein Kampf. Here's Tal 38. Before Hitler joined the German Workers' Party and renamed it the Nazi Party, the leader of the German Workers' Party named Anton Drexler would meet in this building at a restaurant on the ground floor. In September 1919, German army intelligence ordered Hitler to investigate the meeting, basically to see if it was a communist meeting place, and he took to liking it. Drexler invited him, and he became the 55th member. In late 1933, Hitler opened a museum of the Nazi party in this building. And this building was Hitler's apartment after World War I, where he became involved in German Workers' Party politics. This is Hof Brewhaus in Munich. The original beer hall and target of the beer hall push no longer exists, but Hof Brewhaus is still here. These beer gardens were a meeting place for radicals before World War I. It's said that Vladimir Lenin would often visit this one. In 1919, the Bavarian Communist government initiated their own Munich push. They succeeded in setting up the Bavarian Soviet Republic, and their communist headquarters were in the beer garden here. One year after the communist separatists were crushed, Hitler had his first meeting of the Reform Nazi Party on the third floor. Here he formed the SA, the predecessor to the SS, as a street fighting organization combating communists. This is the Munich government building, the final target for Hitler's beer hall push. A few years prior, the communists seized it and established the short-lived Bavarian Soviet Republic, hoping that Russia would push through Poland and extend their influence to the rest of Europe. There's still a memorial to German soldiers here from World War I, and a beautiful garden that stretches right out in front of the building. And trying to reach the government headquarters, Hitler and his beer hall push were cornered in front of the gardens. Police fired into them, killing 16 outside the building, the main square here became a pilgrimage spot, and Hitler said it's where the Nazi party was born in blood. Finally, we're visiting the grave of Stepan Bandera. He's a Ukrainian pro-Axis partisan who many Ukrainians today consider a national hero. He's really too complex to discuss here, because on one hand, he helped form the Ukrainian state, but on the other hand, he also massacred Polish people. Uh, so check out my video on the Ukrainian Nationalist Museum in London to learn more about him, but he's a very dividing figure, particularly as he's been used as a rallying call since the 2014 revolution and against the Soviet authorities during the 1980s and 90s.